Here's a really cool integral that's actually inspired by a previous video I made on the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared times the sine of x squared divided by x squared dx. So we notice that it's pretty much the same structure except for in this case we have a squared sine function. And although the solution developments for both integrals are pretty much exactly the same, this one here gives a very beautiful result. So without further delay, let's call our integral i. And first up, notice that we're integrating an even function of x. So instead of integrating from negative to positive infinity, we could just integrate from 0 to infinity and double the result. So we're interested here in the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared times the square of the sine of x squared divided by x squared dx. And I'm going to solve this integral here using Feynman's approach. So we need to define an integral function i of some parameter t. And we'll define it as the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared times the square of the sine of... Now this is where I'm going to place my parameter t. I'm going to insert it as part of the argument of the sine function here. So we have e to the negative x squared times the square of the sine term divided by x squared. Okay, cool. Now, as per Feynman's approach, we need to differentiate this integral function with respect to the parameter t. And the golden question here is whether we can switch up the order of the integration and the differentiation operators. Well, for that, we need to answer some questions regarding convergence. So we have this, uh, the Gaussian term here, so that acts as a damping factor on this interval. The sine function is bounded to and we have 1 by x squared, which is a decreasing function on the positive half of the real line. Okay, cool. So that means we can, in fact, perform the switch up. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity. And because of the switch up, the total derivative with respect to t now becomes a partial one. So we're differentiating partially with respect to t, e to the negative x squared, times the square of the sine of t x squared, divided by x squared, dx. Now because we're differentiating partially with respect to t, all the x terms here are constants. So we're left with the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared divided by x squared. Now to differentiate this squared sine function, we have twice the sine of t x squared times the cosine of t x squared. And because of, because of the uh, chain rule, we have this factor of x squared being multiplied as well. So that cancels out nicely with this denominator. And we're left with a pretty nice structure to evaluate. We have e to the negative x squared. And twice the product of the sine and the cosine is the double angle formula for the sine function. So we have sine of 2 times t x squared. And we're integrating all of this with respect to x, of course. And this here is the structure of the uh, derivative of i with respect to t. And evaluating this integral is quite simple. All we need is Euler's wonderful formula. So we know that e to the i x equals the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. And here we have the sine of 2 times t x squared. So if you want to get sine, of 2 times t x squared, then that means you need the imaginary part of e to the i times this argument here. So we have 2 i t x squared. Its imaginary part equals this sine term. So using Euler's formula, we replace the triggy boy with an exponential boy. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to t is now the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared, oh, the imaginary part of this integral that is, e to the negative x squared times e to the 2i t x squared dx. And multiplying out the two exponential terms gives me the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the, I'm going to factor out a negative x squared from the exponent, and that gives me a 1 minus 2 times i times t. Okay, cool. So what exactly is this structure that I have obtained for the derivative of i with respect to t? Well, this can be evaluated using the generalized Gaussian integral.
So we know that the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative ax squared dx equals uh, half the square root of pi, oh, sorry about that, half the uh, square root of pi divided by this argument a. So in our case, the argument a here equals one minus two times i times t. Okay, cool, so this is pretty easy to evaluate then. So finally, all of this implies that the derivative of i with respect to t equals the imaginary part of, uh, this here is a constant, so is the square root of two, so we have half the square root of pi times the imaginary part of, uh, we're left with the reciprocal of the square root of our argument a here, which in our case is one minus two times uh, i times t. Uh, okay, nice. And we can just write this as squared pi divided by two times the imaginary part of one minus uh, two i t to the negative one half. Okay, cool. So finally, we have the structure for the derivative of i with respect to t completely in terms of the parameter t. And now we can proceed to recover back our integral function i of t from its derivative. And how we do? And how do we do that? Of course, we have to integrate with respect to the parameter t. So this gives us uh, the square root of pi divided by two uh, times the imaginary part of the integral of one minus two i t to the negative one half d t. So this is pretty easy to evaluate. So we have square root pi by two times the imaginary part of integrating with respect to t and using the power rule, you're gonna get a exponent of one half now, divided by the new exponent one half, and we have to divide by the derivative of this argument here. So that sorts out to uh, negative two times i, correct? Plus you have the constant of integration. So we have some nice cancellation taking place here as well. And in the denominator, we're left with this factor of negative i. And one of the, co and one of the coolest things about complex analysis is that the uh, reciprocal of the imaginary unit equals its own negative. So yeah, that is pretty damn awesome. So the negative of the reciprocal of the imaginary unit equals the imaginary unit itself. So we have square root pi by two times the imaginary part of replacing this by i, so we have i times uh, the square root of one minus two times i times t plus the constant of integration c. And this here is your integral function i of t. Okay, so we need to figure out what value the constant of integration takes here. And for that, we need to recall exactly how we defined our integral function. That was the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x squared times the uh, square of the sine of t x squared divided by x squared dx. So if we plug in t equal to zero here, then that has the benefit of giving you a sine of zero term upstairs and sine zero is just zero. So the entire integral collapses to zero, giving you the case of i of zero being equal to zero, which is pretty damn convenient. So using t equals t equal to zero here, Using the information we have about uh, the integral function at t equal to zero, we have the left-hand side evaluating to zero, and the right-hand side gives us square root pi by two times the imaginary part of i times the square root of one minus two times i times zero, which is just zero, so we have square root one uh, plus c, and the imaginary part of the imaginary unit is, of course, one. So this gives us c equal to the square root of pi by two, the negative of the square root of pi by two, that is. So again, this is pretty convenient given the structure that we have on the right-hand side. Okay, cool. So now with the constant of integration sorted out, what exactly was our target case? Remembering that, wait, um, okay, I just got rid of that earlier. Sorry about that. Remembering that our target case was uh, the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x squared times the square of the sine of x squared divided by x squared dx. And we recognize that this is just your good old integral function evaluated at t equal to one. So 
This implies that I of 1, which is our target case, equals the square root of pi by 2 times the imaginary part of I times the square root of 1 minus 2I minus the square root of pi by 2. Okay, it's now time to separate this bad boy into real and imaginary parts. And for that, we're going to use the polar representation of complex numbers because that's pretty convenient. So we let z be the complex number 1 minus 2 times i. So the modulus of z here equals the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared, which is the square root of 5. And the argument of z, and remember we're only interested in the principal branch, so the argument of z equals the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, which is negative 2, divided by the real part, which is 1 which gives you the inverse tangent of negative 2, and because the inverse tangent is an odd function, we can just pop out the negative sign here. So in the polar form, z equals the square root of 5 times e to the negative i times the inverse tangent of 2. And we need the square root of this complex number here. So this implies that 1 minus 2i, the square root of it, that is, equals the square root of the square root of 5 times e to the negative i times the inverse tangent of 2 divided by 2. And we have to multiply this by i. And remember, we're interested here in the uh, imaginary part. Okay, cool. So once again, using Euler's wonderful formula, we know that e to the negative i times inverse tangent 2 divided by 2 equals uh, the cosine of negative inverse tangent 2 divided by 2. And because the cosine is an even function, we can just ignore this negative sign. Oops, I'm supposed to ignore the negative sign, not the entire inverse tangent. Plus i times the sine of the same argument here and because sine is an odd function we can pop out a negative sign okay cool so I'm running out of space here forgive me but I just hope you're following me so we have negative i times uh, the sine of the inverse tangent of 2 divided by 2 and remember we're multiplying by a factor of i here so multiplying by i gives you an i squared with the cos with the uh, with the sine term and i squared is negative 1 so we have negative of negative 1 which is just positive 1 so the imaginary part here is this cosine term so this implies that the imaginary part of i times the uh, square root of 1 minus 2i equals the cosine of the inverse tangent of 2 divided by 2. So this implies that i of 1 equals the square root of pi by 2 times the imaginary part of this thing, right? And that is the cosine of the inverse tangent of 2 divided by 2 minus square root pi by 2, if I remember correctly. So let me just uh, do a quick check here. So square root pi by 2 times this imaginary part. Oh, okay, fine, yeah. I haven't missed anything. So now to find a nicer representation for this cosine term we have here. And those of you in the comments section right now who are about to point out that I missed something, Yes, you're right. I missed something very important here. I missed this factor of the square root of the square root of 5. Okay, so on the right-hand side, we have the square root of the square root of 5 times the square root of pi by 2 times all of this. And we were about to figure out a nice representation for this cosine term. And for that, we need to consider a triangle where... Uh, the inverse tangent of 2 equals the acute angle in that triangle, u. So this implies that the tangent of u equals 2. So we have a right triangle with the acute angle being considered as u, and the perpendicular here is 2, and the base is 1. And using the Pythagorean theorem, we have the hypotenuse being equal to the square root of 5. Hypotenuse. I'm pretty sure it's pronounced hypotenuse, but... I'm from Pakistan, so we learn some weird ways, ways of uh, pronouncing things. There are some weird pronunciations quite predominant in 
uh, throughout school mathematics. So yeah, I'm pretty used to calling the hypotenuse as hypotenuse, and I think that's a pretty cool name. I mean, think about it. You you have this Autobot called hypotenuse prime. I hypotenuse prime. Anyway, so uh, what did we need? We have this right triangle, and we need the cosine of our angle u by 2. So we're going to make use of the uh, half angle or the double angle formula involving the cosine of u. So we know that the cosine of u equals twice the square of the cosine of half the angle, which is u by 2, our target case, minus 1. So here in this triangle, the cosine of u will be equal to 1 by the square root of 5. So we have uh, the square of the cosine of u by 2 equal to the cosine of u plus 1 divided by 2. So that gives you 1 by the square root of 5 plus 1 divided by 2. And some simplification and square rooting everything yields the cosine of u by 2 being equal to uh, 1 plus the square root of 5 divided by 2 times the square root of 5 all in a square root. And immediately we notice that we have 1 plus the square root of 5 divided by 2, which is of course the golden ratio. So we have the square root of 5, the golden ratio, divided by the square root of 5, and that's the cosine of u by 2. Now returning to our target case, i of 1, this equaled the square root of pi by 2 times the cosine of the inverse tangent of 2 by 2, which evaluates out to the square root of phi divided by the square root of 5. And yes, again, I forgot that factor of the square root of 5, the square root of the square root of 5, that is. Uh, forgot that. Remember that. And okay, so we have some nice cancellations taking place because we can write this as the square root of phi divided by the square root of the square root of 5 cancellation. And we have this minus square root pi by 2 term as well. So factoring out the square root of pi by 2, we're left with the square root of phi minus 1. And that's the case for i of 1. And remembering the whole uh, even function trick we performed at the beginning of the video, we have to double the result. So that means the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the negative x squared times the square of the sine of x squared divided by x squared dx equals this wonderful result of the square root of pi times the square root of phi minus 1. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.